On behalf of the Riverview Church of Christ, I would like to welcome everyone here this morning to the tent meeting. As we desire to, as the subject for this tent meeting is to return to the faith. So what we want to do is we want to examine the scriptures and see what does say of the Lord and what he wants for us to do and what that one faith truly is. I would like to call your attention to Galatians chapter 1. And I will be reading verses 1 through 5. Again, that's Galatians chapter 1, verses 1, and I will terminate at verse number 5. As it reads, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The subject that I would like to expound upon this morning would be the one true gospel. The one true gospel. Now, in order to understand what the one true gospel is, we also have to understand what the gospel is not. When we look at the book of Galatians, Galatians is a beautiful book. Galatians is a defense of the gospel. As Paul was writing to the Galatians, we see that he was writing in regards to what the gospel truly is and what the gospel means to us, what we have to do to have salvation. As Paul was writing to the Galatians, the Galatians had brethren who were coming into their churches, who Paul calls in chapter 2 as false brethren. These brethren would come from the Judea churches, and they would bring in false doctrine to the Galatian churches. These brethren would try to deny Paul as an apostle of God. What these brethren would do is they would say, Paul is not a true uh, apostle. The gospel that Paul preaches is not the true gospel. When you look at what the uh, Judaizers did, is they tried to take the brethren from the Galatian churches and put them under the law of Moses. You know, it reminds me of a few years ago, there were two brethren at a certain local congregation. These brethren were good, sound, faithful men, and they were teaching a new convert into Christ. And this new convert, he was a man who was well-educated. He was a school teacher. But being a new convert in Christ, he didn't know too much about the gospel. He was a babe in Christ. So as this brother began to do study, he would be approached by people at his job. So as this brother would come to worship, he would come and he would ask one of the brothers, one of these two men, I need to talk to you. There's some things that I need to discuss. There's some things that I don't understand. He will continue to come faithfully. He will continue to perform the Lord's will within worship. But then after a while, his attendance started to digress. After a while, he started showing up every here and there. But then he came to worship one evening, and he said, brother, I really need to talk to you. 
So what this brother did is he took the other sound brother one evening, one Tuesday evening. They went over to his house. They sat down at this brother's table, his kitchen table. This brother, well-educated man, said, there are some things that brothers or, excuse me, men at work are bringing to my attention and I, I'm just not educated enough to answer. What he said was that these men at work would say that Paul taught another gospel than what Jesus taught. What these men would say at his job was that don't listen to what Paul is saying within the New Testament scriptures. Only listen to the gospels, the gospel of count of Jesus Christ. So these two sound brethren sat at the table with this man. They went over scripture. They defended scripture. We stayed at this man's house for about five hours, defending the gospel, explaining the gospel to him. There were some things that he tried to throw up as a contradiction, but he couldn't defend it. So he went back to work one day, and these, bro or these men told him, just ignore everything within the New Testament. He came back and told us what these men said. And he later on decided to follow these men. What these men were trying to do is they were trying to negate the gospel. Because if I can negate the gospel, then I can negate what one has to do to be saved. That's why Paul says here in the first verse, I am an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Christ and God himself. Now, when we look at the word apostle, the word apostle means one sent forth. It comes from a Hebrew word called shaluchim. That Hebrew word shaluchim means one who cannot be sent out unless he has orders from his master. And that word, or when we look at the one who is sent out, he's also a representative of his master. Now, Paul makes mention of this as well. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. He speaks of him and the other apostles as ambassadors of Christ. So what Paul is saying here is that I am a true apostle of God and, of, and Christ himself. Paul was not apostle by man. He didn't get his teaching from man. There was no church group that came together and said, Paul, we know that you love the Lord. You, we know that you're faithful. Therefore, we charge you to go out to the Gentile world and establish many congregations. There was no group of men. There was not one man who came to Paul and taught Paul the gospel. Now, when we look at verse 1 as well, notice the contrast between men and Jesus. As Paul says, neither by man, not of man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. If Jesus was just a mere man, then Paul's, then Paul's gospel would be null and void. What Paul does is he puts Jesus Christ on the same level as God the Father. Now, when we look at what an apostle is, and when we look at Galatians chapter 1, Paul puts himself on equal standing with the other apostles. If you drop down to verse 17, he says, neither of the apostles before me. Paul puts himself on equal ground with the other apostles. Therefore, when you look at this, Paul is saying that I spoke to Christ. I have seen Christ. One could not be a true apostle of God unless he has seen Christ and unless he has spoken to Christ directly. Just as you were looking at me and I'm looking at you, just as I am talking to you, that's how Paul and the other apostles talk to Christ. Now, when we look at the word apostle as well, there were many other apostles not selected by Christ himself, but there were many other who were called apostles within the New Testament scriptures. We have Barnabas who was called an apostle. But what Paul is saying here is of special significance. Paul was charged 
by Christ himself to go out and to preach the gospel, what God wanted for man to do. Now, with that being said, the highest level that man could have, the highest duty that man could have is to be an apostle of God, to be charged by Christ himself to go out and spread the gospel, to be taught by Christ. Therefore, when we look at what the gospel is not, when we look at what the Catholic Church is, the Catholic Church has a pope. The pope is considered to be infallible. The pope is considered to be Lord on earth. The pope in their doctrine considers the pope to be one who was made by God himself. Therefore, when we look at this, the gospel does not contain a pope. It is not of Catholic origin. That is not the gospel. Now, when we drop down to verse 6, now when we look at verses 2 through 5, Paul is, you know, explaining his introduction. Then he goes on and jumps into verse 6. As he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, what we have here is men who were in the gospel, but were removed from the gospel because they didn't obey the gospel. What this does, it is in the gates, once saved, always saved. The doctrine of once saved, always saved is explained or taught as one who was saved, there is nothing they can do that can take them out of their saved state. There is nothing they can do to remove them from the grace of God. A few months ago, there was, in my neighborhood, there was a, a congregation that would come around in my neighborhood. They would evangelize in my neighborhood. They were trying to get you know, men and women to come to their church. And every Saturday, they would come. One Saturday, they came and they knocked on my door. So I opened up the door, and they were passing out pamphlets. And they, you know, tried to give me a pamphlet. I said, no, thank you. I don't want it. And they were startled by that. They said, well, it's free. Don't worry about it. You know, take it and read it, and we would like to have you come to our, you know, congregation and worship with us. I said, no, I don't want that. And I went on to say, what do you teach within your congregation? What is the main thing that you teach within your congregation? And they said, well, we teach once saved, always saved. There's nothing that you can do that can remove yourself from the grace of God. So I went on to have a Bible study with them there in my doorway at my house. Pulled out the Bible. As a matter of fact, I used their Bible. And I showed them what they taught was in error. And they tried to defend, you know, their, their stance. But every verse that I brought up, they couldn't defend. The most that they can do is they could say is, well, we need to have men who are more equipped to study and to break down the word come back and explain this to you. And I said, sure, fine. That's not a problem with me. So what I did is I, you know, gave them my number. I gave them my address, and I told them, you know, give me a call. You know, you're welcome to come back to my house, have these men come to my house, and we can sit down and we can, you know, go over what the Bible says concerning this doctrine. Well, since that day, they've never come back to my house, and I'm still waiting on them to come back to my house. They haven't come back because they can't defend that doctrine. Because when you teach a once saved, always saved doctrine, you come in contact with verses such as these that shows that those who were once obedient to the faith fell from grace. So when you look at this, we know the true gospel does not include once saved, always saved. It does not include once saved, always saved. And this congregation was a Baptist congregation. Now, as we continue to go further, if you look at this verse as well, he says that you were called into another gospel. That word another, in its Greek form, is heteros. What that word means is not of the same quality as the gospel that I've given to you, not of the same quality as the gospel that I've explained to you. Now, when you look at verse 7 here, 
He says, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, the word another in this verse, in its Greek form is alos, which means there is no other gospel. There is not another gospel. The one that I've given to you is the gospel. There's not another gospel that's of the same quality of the gospel that I've given to you. There is no other gospel other than the one that I've given to you. Also, when you look at this verse here, you see the word trouble. That word trouble means to stir up mentally, to cause a mental commotion, to disturb the peace mentally. You know, as we look at this verse, the doctrine that these Judaizers were teaching was not a doctrine of, you know, going against the gospel of Christ in regards to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel that they were teaching was not a gospel that denied baptism. What this gospel that these Judaizers were teaching was a gospel of all you have to do is have faith that Jesus Christ died, buried, and was resurrected, but you still have to obey the law of Moses. Therefore, what they were teaching is a saved only salvation or mental faith in Christ. Therefore, when we look at what the gospel is not, as Paul is breaking this down, we see that the gospel is not a mental faith only. There's more to being saved and to save a salvation of Christ than a mental faith. Now, when you look at that, who teaches a mental faith? Who teaches that all I have to do is believe in Christ to be saved? Well, we have the Methodists. The Methodists teach that. We also have the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians teach that as well. Now, what these Judaizer brethren were doing is they are trying to destroy the Paul, or excuse me, the gospel of Paul, as according to Christ. These brethren were trying to get these men under the law of Moses. As we look at verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why would Paul say, though we or an angel? Why would Paul say if an angel would preach another gospel to you? Do you guys know that the law of Moses was spoken through angels? The law of Moses was ordained by angels. When you look at the martyr Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, as he was preaching to a stubborn, a stiff-necked Jews, what he said is, you were given a law as it was ordained by angels, but you didn't keep it. They killed him. When you look at Galatians 3, verse 19, Paul says it himself there, the law being ordained by angels, but you didn't keep it. When you look at the, uh, the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer. Now, let me explain the book of Hebrews for a minute. The book of Hebrews was written to the Jews who were being persecuted by the Gentiles and by, excuse me, by those um, within the law of Moses. They were being persecuted and they were trying to force them to come back into the law of Moses under that form of uh, system. And they were thinking about going. They, what these uh, Judaizers would say is that we have a law that was given to us by angels. Therefore, it's higher than Jesus because Jesus was just a mere man. And when you look at Hebrews 2 verse 2, he says, for if the words spoken by angels... So we know that the law was given by angels. And that's what these Judaizers believed and loved. They had so much splendor in the fact that the law was given by angels. Now, when we look at today's world, we also can see that within today's world, there are men who try to use angels to get men to come to their God, uh, doctrine, to their gospel, their form of gospel. Who are some of those? Well, when you look at the Mormon congregation, Joseph Smith, what he does is he says that the angel Maroni came to him and spoke things to him, gave him his doctrine, therefore we need to obey it. That's where you get the Book of Mormons from. Therefore, we know that the Mormon church is not of the true gospel. 
spoken by the angel Moroni. Now, when we look at the Islam, Islam, the Muslim religion, Muhammad says that the angel Gabriel came to him in a cave, spoke to him things that needed to be done, spoke to him the true teachings that came from Allah, which is God. We know that the Muslim religion is not of the true gospel. When we look at the Seventh Day of Venice, the Seventh Day of Venice had a woman by the name of Ellen White. Ellen White was, had very high influence within that, um, that doctrine, within that religion. What she would say within her writings is that she was accompanied by angels who gave her things to teach those within the Seventh Day of Venice religion. Therefore, we know that the Seventh Day of Venice is not of the true gospel. When we look at the Jehovah Witnesses, the Jehovah Witnesses say that the Archangel Michael came down and came to New York in the year 1916. They say that the Archangel Michael came down and he is actually Jesus Christ. Arch, uh, the Archangel Michael is actually Jesus Christ. That's who they believe. That's what they believe. Therefore, they believe that their doctrine came from the Archangel Michael, Jehovah's Witnesses are not of the true gospel. That's why Paul says, if an angel or any other man preach any other gospel to you than that which I have preached, let that man be accursed. And he says in verse 9, if you haven't heard me, let me tell you again as if I told you before when I was with you. If any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Then he goes on to say in verse 10, for now, do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What Paul says is that after everything that I've explained to you, am I trying to please men? Am I trying to gain a following like these Judaizer brethren are saying? Am I trying to please you? Am I going from one Gentile congregation to another trying to please them and gain a following? If I did that, let me be accursed, because it's not the gospel of Christ. And he goes on to say in verse 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. Paul says what these Judaizer brethren are doing is they're telling you that my gospel isn't a true gospel, but I'm telling you that the gospel which I preach is not after man. Now, when we look at that in today's world, the gospel of the Catholics, the gospel of the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, Presbyterians, the Mormons, the Muslims, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh Day Adventists. These are gospels that are not after Christ. These are gospels made after man. We look at verse 12. He says, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught of it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. The gospel that Paul preached came from Jesus Christ himself. The gospel that Paul preached was the gospel that you have salvation in. The gospel that Paul preached is the gospel where grace can be found. Then as Paul continues to go on to defend the gospel, what he does in the, uh, verses 13 through 15, is he gives a little background history of himself. Paul says, look, you've heard about me. You know who I am. I was a Jew among Jews. I was persecuting the church. I was throwing Christians in jail. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. There was nobody within the Jewish religion who had more zeal for the Jewish religion than I. But I've changed. Something happened to me, and I've changed. Paul, on the road to Damascus, met Jesus Christ. Paul on the road to Damascus saw the resurrected Christ, which he knew had died. Paul says, I've changed because I've seen Christ. And Paul goes on to say 
when you look at Philippians chapter 3. If by any means that I may have the same resurrection that this man Christ has, I'm going to defend the gospel. I'm going to do everything that I can within my means to spread that gospel, to keep that gospel. Paul says, I've changed. When you look at verse 15, Paul says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Now, what we have in this verse here is similar to Jeremiah of the Old Testament. When you look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God told Jeremiah at that time that I knew you before I even created you in the womb. Now, what this does is it does not give way to predestination. This verse here does not give way to God chose Paul to be saved. What Paul is saying is God, through his all knowing power, God, who is able to see the beginning from the end, knew Paul, knew what he would do, knew how Paul would react if God was to bring him to this situation. Therefore, Paul goes on to say that I have decided to obey. Now, to further prove that point that Paul decided to obey, you look at Acts 26, verse 19. As Paul was explaining to King Agrippa, Paul says that he was not disobedient to the vision that Christ had given him. Therefore, if predestination were to exist, there would be no need for Paul to be disobedient. Paul had a choice he was able to make to either obey or to be disobedient. And Paul says, I wasn't disobedient. Now, when you look at uh, the predestination, those within that religion... Those within that religion, there are many within that religion who believe that, but for the sake of the example, we look at the Episcopalian church. The Episcopalians believe predestination, again, along with others as well, but for the sake of this example, we'll use them. Paul says, I decided not to be disobedient to the gospel. And when you look at verses, uh, let's read verses 16 through uh, 18. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them, which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now, when we look at verse 18, what many try to say is that at this time that Paul went up to see Peter within that 15-day period, Peter explained the gospel to Paul. Therefore, uh, Paul got his gospel from Peter. But when you look at this word see in verse 18, this word see in verse 18 in its Greek form is the word heteros. That word heteros means one who came to know by being acquainted. Paul came to see Peter through acquaintance, to get to know Peter. Paul didn't come to see Peter to have revelation of the gospel. Verse 19, but others of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Paul is not calling James an apostle. James had high influence within the Jerusalem church at that time. If you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul calls James a pillar. James was a pillar. He had high influence. He was the Lord's brother. So Paul calls James a pillar. So he calls his name so that these Judaizing brethren cannot claim James to go against Paul's gospel. Verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I'm not, I lie not. What we have in this verse here is a virtual oath. Now if you know anything about oaths, within the states... What the court system would do in, their, uh, in the Judea, uh, judicial system, what they would do is that anyone who is, has to testify, they would come, they would place their hand on the Bible, raise their right hand, and they would say, do you believe or do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? You say, I do. Those who then want to have the Bible, they still make you place up your right hand, and they say, do you uh, swear to tell or be faithful in your statements by the judicial system within the courts of our law. And they would say, I do. Now, with those given statements that you make within that court system, lawyers, 
judges, they can go back and analyze those statements. And if found to be false, then there's punishment to be had. Now, what Paul does is he said he calls God to the witness stand. Therefore, what he's doing at the same time is he's calling the Galatian brethren, he's calling these Judaizer brethren to analyze his statements, to see if his statements are false. And since he's calling God to the witness stand, death would be the penalty. So this is what Paul is saying here. He will raise up his right hand. He will say, behold, the things which I have told you, the things which I'm explaining to you, I came to see Peter. I didn't come to get my revelation from Peter. I came to get acquainted with Peter. There was no lowering of my apostleship from any other apostles. Now behold, the things that I say to you before God, I lie not. Therefore, there should be no misunderstanding about the gospel which I preach. Furthermore, you see the change that I've made. Verse 21, afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Now, when we look at verse 22, verse 22 has a present tense participle, which is preceded by an imperfect verb. So it should be translated as I remained unknown. What Paul is saying is, if I was under the influence of the other apostles, if I was taught by the other apostles, I would have had to been in the Judea region where the other apostles were at. But I was given the work to the Gentile nation, and I remained unknown to, these, uh, to the Judea, or excuse me, to Judea. Verse 23. But they had heard only that which he per persecuted us in times past, now preaches faith, which once he destroyed. Now, in this verse as well, we also have a present, uh, present tense participle only, preceded, which precedes a, uh, by, excuse me, which is preceded um, by the imperfect verb. What Paul is saying here in this verse is that continuous action. They kept hearing. But at the same time, it's in contrast with the preceding verse, verse 22. What Paul is saying is, though I remained unknown, they kept hearing. They kept hearing about how I was once persecuting the church, but now I'm for the church. They kept hearing that I was spreading the gospel. I can only imagine how those first century uh, Christians must have felt. Anytime they're worshiping on any given Sunday, they would have to be worried that Paul was going to come in, snatch them up, have them beaten, have them put to death. But they see the change that Paul has made. They see that Paul, who was once persecuting Christians, has now become a Christian himself. Now, when you look at verse 24, verse 24 says, and they glorify God in me. Powerful point. What Paul is saying is these same Judaizers, these same false brethren who came out of these Judea churches, those Judea churches are thanking God for me. These same false brethren who are trying to take you away from the gospel of Christ, the churches that they come out of, are glorifying God for me because they see the change. They've heard about the change that I've made. Now, when we look at this, we look at what the, the gospel is not. Again, the gospel is not of Catholic origin. It's not of Baptist origin. It's not of the Methodist or Presbyterian origin. The gospel is not the Mormon church. The gospel is not of Muslims. The gospel is not of the Seven Day Adventists, is not of the Episcopalian Church, nor is it from the Jehovah's Witnesses. The doctrine that they teach within their system is not the same gospel that Paul preached. Therefore, what is the gospel of Christ? What is the one true gospel? What is taught within the one true gospel? Turning your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? What is required within the one true gospel is for us to obey the truth. In order to have salvation, truth must be obeyed. How do you obey truth? You come by hearing the gospel. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You come by believing the gospel, Hebrews 11 and 6, for without faith it is impossible to please God. You come by confessing Christ to be the Son of God, Romans 10 and 10, so with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You come, you obey the truth by repenting of your sins, Luke 13 and 3. As Jesus said, I tell you, unless you repent, you shall all in like manner perish. And you come by being immersed for the remission of your sins, Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then finally, obeying the truth, you have to be, uh, remain faithful unto death. As Jesus said in Revelation 2, verse 10, if you remain faithful unto death, you shall receive the crown of life. That word faithful means to execute commands. You have to execute the commands of Christ to be faithful to the gospel. And as I close, if there is any who would like to come to the gospel, we ask that you come at this time. Thank you. I will